This is Reed Daly's Come Follow Me podcast. In this podcast series, lesson and scripture audio are combined for a hands-free experience. The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is kindly granting permission to use the audio content heard in this podcast. We express our gratitude for their generosity. At the end of this podcast, you can hear our full disclosure statement or read it on readdaily.live. March 8th through 14th, Doctrine and Covenants, Sections 23 through 26, Strengthen the Church. As you read Doctrine and Covenants, Sections 23 through 26, make note of the impressions you receive from the Holy Ghost. How can you apply the counsel in these revelations to strengthen your own discipleship and also the Church? After the Church was organized, the saints faced a new challenge to spread the gospel and strengthen those who had already united with the Church, all while persecution continued to increase. Emma Smith witnessed the opposition firsthand. In June 1830, Emma and members of the Knight family wished to be baptized, but enemies of the church tried to disrupt what should have been a sacred experience. First, they destroyed the dam that had been built to provide deep enough water for the baptisms. Even after the dam was repaired, the persecutors gathered to shout threats and mock those being baptized. Then, just as Joseph was about to confirm the new members, he was arrested for upsetting the community by preaching about the Book of Mormon. It seemed like an unpromising start for the Lord's newly restored church. But in the midst of this uncertainty and upheaval, the Lord provided precious words of counsel and encouragement, which represent His voice unto all. See Doctrine and Covenants, section 25, verse 16. And verily, verily, I say unto you, that this is my voice unto all. Amen. See also Saints, Volume 1, pages 89 through 90 and 94 through 97. Chapter 9 Come Life or Come Death The Sunday after the church was organized, Oliver preached to the Whitmer family and their friends in Fayette. Many of them had supported the Book of Mormon translation, but had not yet joined the church. After Oliver finished speaking, six people asked him to baptize them in a nearby lake. As more people joined the church, the immensity of the Lord's commission to take the gospel to the world weighed on Joseph. He had published the Book of Mormon and organized the Lord's church, but the book was selling poorly, and those who sought baptism were mostly his friends and relatives and Joseph still had much to learn about heaven and earth. People who joined the church often came seeking the gifts of the Spirit and other miracles they read about in the New Testament, but the restored gospel promised believers something even greater than wonders and signs. Benjamin, a wise prophet and king in the Book of Mormon, had taught that if people yielded to the Holy Spirit, they could shed their sinful nature and become saints through the atonement of Jesus Christ. For Joseph, the challenge now was how to move the Lord's work forward. He and Oliver knew they had to cry repentance to all people. The field was ready to harvest, and the worth of every soul was great in the eyes of God. But how could two young apostles, a farmer and a schoolteacher, both in their early twenties, move such a great work forward? And how could a small church in rural New York rise above its humble beginnings and grow to fill the entire world? In late June 1830, Emma traveled with Joseph and Oliver to Colesville. Word of Joseph's miracle that spring had spread throughout the area, and now the Knights and several other families wanted to join the church. Emma was also ready to be baptized. Like the Knights, she believed in the restored gospel and in her husband's prophetic call, but she had not yet joined the church. After arriving in Colesville, Joseph worked with others to dam a nearby stream so they could hold a baptismal meeting the following day. When morning came, however, they discovered that someone had wrecked the dam overnight to prevent the baptisms from taking place. Disappointed, they held a Sabbath day meeting instead, and Oliver preached on baptism and the Holy Ghost. 
After the sermon, a local minister and some members of his congregation broke up the meeting and tried to drag one of the believers away. Emma was all too familiar with opposition to Joseph and his message. Some people called him a fraud and accused him of trying to profit off his followers. Others mocked believers, calling them Mormonites. Wary of trouble, Emma and the others returned to the stream early the next day and repaired the dam. Once the water was deep enough, Oliver waded into the middle of the pool and baptized Emma, Joseph, and Polly Knight, and ten others. During the baptisms, some men stood along the bank a short distance back and heckled the believers. Emma and the others tried to ignore them, but when the group headed back to the night farm, the men followed, shouting threats at the prophet along the way. At the knight's house, Joseph and Oliver wanted to confirm the newly baptized women and men, but the group of hecklers outside swelled to a noisy mob of fifty. Worried they might be attacked, the believers fled to a neighboring house, hoping to finish the confirmations in peace, but before they could perform the ordinances, a constable arrested Joseph and carried him off to jail for causing an uproar in the community by preaching the Book of Mormon. Joseph spent the night in custody, unsure if the mob would capture him and carry out their threats. Emma, meanwhile, waited anxiously at her sister's house while she and their Colesville friends prayed for Joseph's safe release. Over the next two days, Joseph was tried in court and acquitted, only to be arrested and tried again on similar charges. After his second hearing, he was set free, and he and Emma returned to their farm in Harmony before she and the Colesville saints could be confirmed as members of the church. Back home, Joseph tried again to work on his farm, but the Lord gave him a new revelation on how he should spend his time. Thou shalt devote all thy service in Zion, the Lord declared. In temporal labors thou shalt not have strength, for this is not thy calling. Joseph was told to plant his fields and then set off to confirm the new members in New York. The revelation left much uncertainty in Emma's life. How would they earn a living if Joseph devoted all his time to the saints? And what would she do while he was away serving the church? Was she supposed to stay at home? Or did the Lord want her to go with him? And if he did, what would be her role in the church? Knowing Emma's desire for guidance, the Lord spoke to her in a revelation given through Joseph. He forgave her sins and called her an elect lady. He directed her to go with Joseph in his travels and promised, Thou shalt be ordained under his hand to expound scriptures and to exhort the church. He also calmed her fears about their finances. Thou needest not fear, he assured her, for thy husband shall support thee. The Lord then instructed her to make a selection of sacred hymns for the church. For my soul delighteth in the song of the heart, he said. Soon after the revelation, Joseph and Emma traveled to Colesville, where Emma and the saints there were finally confirmed. As the new members received the gift of the Holy Ghost, the Spirit of the Lord filled the room. Everyone rejoiced and praised God. Ideas for Personal Scripture Study Doctrine and Covenants, Sections 23-26 through 26. I Can Help Strengthen the Lord's Church Today, almost 200 years after the restored church was organized, the need to strengthen the church continues. See Doctrine and Covenants, section 23, verses 3 through 5. Behold, I speak unto you, Hiram, a few words. For thou also art under no condemnation, and thy heart is opened, and thy tongue loosed, and thy calling is to exhortation, and to strengthen the church continually. Wherefore thy duty is unto the church forever, and this because of thy family. Amen. Behold, I speak a few words unto you, Samuel, for thou also art under no condemnation, and thy calling is to exhortation, and to strengthen the church, and thou art not as yet called to preach before the world. Amen. Behold, I speak a few words unto you, Joseph, for thou also art under no condemnation, and thy calling also is to exhortation, and to strengthen the church, and this is thy duty from henceforth and forever. Amen.
And this work is not just for Joseph Smith, Oliver Cowdery, or our current church leaders. It is for all of us. Throughout your study of Doctrine and Covenants, sections 23 through 26, ponder the counsel the Lord gave early church members to help them strengthen the church. What do you feel the Lord wants you to do to participate in this effort? Doctrine and Covenants, section 24. The Savior can lift me up out of my afflictions. Leading the church during a time of intense persecution must have been a heavy burden for Joseph Smith. Look for the Lord's words of encouragement to him in Doctrine and Covenants, section 24. What do the following scriptures suggest to you about how the Savior can lift you out of your afflictions? Doctrine and Covenants, section 24, verses 1 through 3. Behold, thou wast called and chosen to write the Book of Mormon, and to my ministry. And I have lifted thee up out of thine afflictions, and have counseled thee that thou hast been delivered from all thine enemies, and thou hast been delivered from the powers of Satan and from darkness. Nevertheless, thou art not excusable in thy transgressions. Nevertheless, go thy way, and sin no more. Magnify thine office, and after thou hast sowed thy fields and secured them, go speedily unto the church which is in Colesville, Fayette, and Manchester, and they shall support thee, and I will bless them both spiritually and temporally. Doctrine and Covenants, section 24, verse 8. Be patient in afflictions, for thou shalt have many. But endure them, for lo, I am with thee, even unto the end of thy days. Doctrine and Covenants, section 121, verses 7 through 8. My son, peace be unto thy soul. Thine adversity and thine afflictions shall be but a small moment, and then, if thou endure it well, God shall exalt thee on high, thou shalt triumph over all thy foes. Isaiah chapter 40 verses 28 through 31 Hast thou not known, hast thou not heard, that the everlasting God, the Lord, the Creator of the ends of the earth, fainteth not, neither is weary? There is no searching of his understanding. He giveth power to the faint, and to them that have no might he increaseth strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. Mosiah chapter 24 verses 14 through 15 and I will also ease the burdens which are put upon your shoulders, that even you cannot feel them upon your backs, even while you are in bondage. And this will I do, that ye may stand as witnesses for me hereafter, and that ye may know of a surety that I, the Lord God, do visit my people in their afflictions. And now it came to pass, that the burdens which were laid upon Alma and his brethren were made light, Yea, the Lord did strengthen them, that they could bear up their burdens with ease, and they did submit cheerfully and with patience to all the will of the Lord. How has Jesus Christ lifted you out of your afflictions? What can you do to continue to seek His help during difficult times? Doctrine and Covenants, Section 25 Emma Smith is an elect lady. When Emma Hale married Joseph Smith, she likely knew she would be making sacrifices. She was going against the wishes of her father and trading a relatively comfortable life for a life of uncertainty. She might have wondered what the Lord expected of her in the work of the Restoration. Look for the answers the Lord provided in Doctrine and Covenants section 25. Section 25 Revelation given through Joseph Smith the Prophet at Harmony, Pennsylvania, July 1830. See the heading to section 24. This revelation manifests the will of the Lord to Emma Smith, the Prophet's wife. 1 through 6. Emma Smith, an elect lady, 
is called to aid and comfort her husband. 7 through 11. She is also called to write, to expound scriptures, and to select hymns. 12 through 14. The song of the righteous is a prayer unto the Lord. 15 through 16. Principles of obedience in this revelation are applicable to all. Hearken unto the voice of the Lord your God, while I speak unto you, Emma Smith, my daughter. For verily I say unto you, All those who receive my gospel are sons and daughters in my kingdom. A revelation I give unto you concerning my will. And if thou art faithful and walk in the paths of virtue before me, I will preserve thy life, and thou shalt receive an inheritance in Zion. Behold, thy sins are forgiven thee, and thou art an elect lady whom I have called. Murmur not because of the things which thou hast not seen, for they are withheld from thee and from the world, which is wisdom in me in a time to come. And the office of thy calling shall be for a comfort unto my servant Joseph Smith, Jr., thy husband, in his afflictions, with consoling words in the spirit of meekness. And thou shalt go with him at the time of his going, and be unto him for a scribe, while there is no one to be a scribe for him, that I may send my servant, Oliver Cowdery, whithersoever I will. And thou shalt be ordained under his hand to expound scriptures, and to exhort the church according as it shall be given thee by my Spirit. For he shall lay his hands upon thee, and thou shalt receive the Holy Ghost, and thy time shall be given to writing and to learning much. And thou needest not fear, for thy husband shall support thee in the church. For unto them is his calling, that all things might be revealed unto them, whatsoever I will, according to their faith. And verily I say unto thee that thou shalt lay aside the things of this world, and seek for the things of a better. And it shall be given thee also to make a selection of sacred hymns, as it shall be given thee, which is pleasing unto me to be had in my church. For my soul delighteth in the song of the heart. Yea, the song of the righteous is a prayer unto me, and it shall be answered with a blessing upon their heads. Wherefore lift up thy heart and rejoice, and cleave unto the covenant which thou hast made. Continue in the spirit of meekness, and beware of pride. Let thy soul delight in thy husband, and the glory which shall come upon him. Keep my commandments continually, and a crown of righteousness thou shalt receive. And except thou do this, where I am you cannot come. And verily, verily, I say unto you, that this is my voice unto all. Amen. Note the Lord's words in verse 16. And verily, verily, I say unto you, that this is my voice unto all. Amen. Do you find anything in this section that you feel is His voice unto you? See also An Elect Lady, video, churchofjesuschrist.org. Joseph. What did the Lord mean in the Revelation by an elect lady? Well, he meant you. You, Emma, are a woman of great worth. Sometimes I wonder. I don't think your father likes me much. Father is just being fatherly. It's stubborn. About what? Just some stories he's heard. What if I told you that some of them are true? Of visions and angels? If I had not experienced what I have, I might not believe it myself. But you do believe it. I see it in your eyes. your father's permission. He wouldn't even hear me out. Until he gives up these foolish ideas, he is no longer welcome in this house. Don't you want to find
find out for yourself. I wish I could. I'm sorry. The distance between us The stretches of pain Will not divide us I remain The hands of Took you away Can't separate us I remain There will always be opposition Through walls and bars And running streams Over rising hills And sinking valleys With God as our strength Everyone thinks I'm strong. I don't feel strong. Has God forsaken us? God will not take another of my children. Promise me. Emma is strong, Mother. Being strong can be a very lonely thing. Emma, the Lord is going to let me rest for a while. Whatever happens, the Lord is in it. Do you ever wonder if he asks too much? I do not let myself. I have never seen a woman in my life who would endure every species of fatigue and hardship from month to month and from year to year with that unflinching courage, zeal, and patience which she has ever done. Emma? Emma? If we are faithful, all of our losses will be made up. Thou art an elect lady, in Revelations in Context, pages 33 through 39. Thou art an elect lady. Doctrine and Covenants, Sections 24, 25, 26, and 27 by Matthew J. Grow. In the months following the April 1830 organization of the Church of Christ, as the Church was then known, Emma Hale Smith began to understand more fully what her husband's prophetic calling would mean for her and their young family. Emma, who turned 26 years old on July 10, 1830, had married Joseph three years earlier despite the objections of her parents, Isaac and Elizabeth Hale. She believed in the visions and revelations received by her husband, and those three eventful years had confirmed to her that he was indeed a prophet. By the time of their marriage, Joseph had met with the angel Moroni once a year for three consecutive years at a hill near Palmyra, New York, to discuss the golden plates from which he would translate the Book of Mormon. In the fall of 1827, Emma went with Joseph and waited in the wagon while he received the golden plates. She soon began to assist as a scribe in the translation process. 
I frequently wrote day after day, she later recalled, often sitting at the table close by him, he sitting with his face buried in his hat, with the stone in it, and dictating hour after hour with nothing between us. He had neither manuscript nor book to read from. If he had had anything of the kind, he could not have concealed it from me. The plates often lay on the table without any attempt at concealment, wrapped in a small linen tablecloth. I once felt of the plates as they thus lay on the table, tracing their outline and shape. Decades later she marveled at what had happened. She recalled that at the time of their marriage Joseph could neither write nor dictate a coherent and well-worded letter, let alone dictating a book like the Book of Mormon. Emma's Trials But these spiritual experiences had been accompanied by inconvenience and pain. Joseph and Emma first lived with the Smith family in Manchester, New York, and then moved to live with the Hales in Harmony, Pennsylvania, where Emma had grown up. During their first years of marriage, the couple moved at least four times between Harmony and upstate New York, traversing approximately 300 miles each time. In June 1828, Emma gave birth to a son who died the same hour of his birth. Their early years were filled with poverty. Joseph wrote that in 1829 they had become very poor, reduced in property, he termed it, and Emma's father was about to turn me out of doors, and I had not where to go. And I cried unto the Lord that he would provide for me to accomplish the work whereunto he had commanded me. In their hour of need, faithful friends such as Josiah Stowell, Martin Harris, and Oliver Cowdery often provided Joseph and Emma with financial assistance. Notwithstanding these challenges, Emma desired to be baptized in June 1830. Joseph and Emma traveled to Colesville, New York, where she was baptized along with several other converts, including members of the Knight family, who had also supported them financially during the translation of the Book of Mormon. However, on the evening of Sunday, June 27, opponents of the infant church destroyed a dam built for the baptisms. Early the next morning, Joseph Smith's history recounts, We were on the alert, and before our enemies were aware, we had repaired the dam and proceeded to baptize. Oliver Cowdery baptized Emma and twelve others. Before the baptismal service had ended, the mob began again to collect, and shortly after we had retired, they amounted to about fifty men. Joseph, Emma, and the other church members had gone in to Joseph Knight Sr.'s home, but it was soon surrounded by men raging with anger and apparently wishful to commit violence upon us. Joseph Smith's history continues. Some asked us questions, others threatened us, so that we thought it wisdom to leave and go to the house of Newell Knight. Nevertheless, the saints were followed, and the harassment continued. The saints planned a meeting for that evening, during which Emma and the other newly baptized individuals would receive the gift of the Holy Ghost and be confirmed members of the church. However, as they gathered, a constable arrested Joseph Smith on charge of being a disorderly person, of setting the country in an uproar by preaching the Book of Mormon. The constable explained that the mob hoped to ambush Joseph after his arrest. However, the constable was determined to save me from them, as he had found me to be a different sort of person from what I had been represented to him. They soon encountered the mob, but to the great disappointment of the vigilantes, the constable gave the horse the whip and drove me out of their reach. After arriving in South Bainbridge in Chenango County, the constable stayed with Joseph Smith that night in an upper room of a tavern. To protect Joseph, the constable slept during the night with his feet against the door and a loaded musket by his side. Joseph Smith was tried and acquitted in South Bainbridge, but then immediately arrested again to stand trial on similar charges in neighboring Broome County. The second constable initially treated Joseph harshly. When they arrived in Broome County, Joseph Smith's history records, He took me to a tavern and gathered in a number of men who used every means to abuse, ridicule, and insult me. They spat on Joseph and demanded that he prophesy to them, Relatively close to their home now, Joseph asked that he be allowed the privilege of spending the night with my wife at home. 
but the constable denied his request. Following a second trial the next day, Joseph was again acquitted. The constable, according to Joseph Smith's history, now asked my forgiveness. Learning of plans by the mob to tar and feather Joseph, the constable helped him escape. Joseph arrived safely at the nearby house of Elizabeth Hale Wasson, Emma's sister. During her husband's absence, Emma had been awaiting with much anxiety the issue of those ungodly proceedings. She had gathered with other women for the purpose of praying for the deliverance of her husband. Once reunited, Joseph and Emma traveled home to Harmony, Pennsylvania in early July. Along with Oliver Cowdery, Joseph made one more unsuccessful trip to Colesville to confirm the newly baptized saints, but quickly returned to Harmony in the face of renewed opposition. Outpouring of Revelation Following his return to Harmony, Joseph Smith received three revelations in July 1830. The first revelation, now known as Doctrine and Covenants, section 24, addressed Joseph and Oliver Cowdery, telling them concerning their calls. The revelation reminded them that they had been called to write the Book of Mormon and to my ministry. Likely referring in part to their recent opposition, the revelation continued, I have lifted thee up out of thine afflictions, and have counseled thee that thou hast been delivered from all thine enemies. The revelation also spoke of Joseph Smith's material circumstances, instructing him to visit church members in Colesville, Fayette, and Manchester after he had sowed his fields. The revelation made clear that Joseph should be supported by church members so he could devote all his service in Zion. Joseph was told, in temporal labors thou shalt not have strength, for this is not thy calling. This revelation led Joseph and Emma to understand that they would struggle financially and need to rely on support from church members because of their dedication to the ministry. Whatever Emma's hopes for her married life were, she could hardly have anticipated the degree to which opponents of the new church would physically intimidate and legally harass the Smiths, or the way the demands of preaching and church administration would take her husband away from their farm and family, disrupting their home life and threatening their livelihood. In the context of these anxieties and disappointments, Joseph received a revelation for Emma, Doctrine and Covenants, section 25, which reiterated, Verily I say unto thee that thou shalt lay aside the things of this world and seek for the things of a better. Through the revelation, Emma received words of consolation and instruction. She was told, Murmur not because of the things which thou hast not seen, for they are withheld from thee and the world. Perhaps a reference to the golden plates, which Emma later recalled she had handled on one occasion, but not seen. The revelation called Emma an elect lady, and told her that the office of thy calling shall be for a comfort unto my servant Joseph thy husband in his afflictions, with consoling words in the spirit of meekness. The revelation also spoke of Emma's work in the church, promising that she would be ordained by her husband to expound scriptures and exhort the church. Furthermore, Emma was instructed to serve as a scribe to her husband and to compile a hymnal, Joseph Smith later explained that Emma was ordained at the time the revelation was given to expound the scriptures to all and to teach the female part of community, and that not she alone but others may attain to the same blessings. The third revelation received by Joseph Smith in July 1830, now canonized as Doctrine and Covenants, section 26, instructed Joseph, along with Oliver Cowdery and John Whitmer, to dedicate their time to the studying of the Scriptures, and to preaching, and to confirming the church at Colesville, and to performing thy labors on the land. In early August, a few weeks following these three revelations, Newell and Sally Knight traveled from Colesville, New York, to visit Joseph and Emma Smith in Harmony, Pennsylvania. Sally Knight had been baptized on the same day as Emma, but neither had been confirmed. As such, Joseph Smith's history recounts, It was proposed that we should confirm them and partake together of the sacrament, before he and his wife should leave us. 
In order to prepare for this, I set out to go to procure some wine for the occasion, but had gone only a short distance when I was met by a heavenly messenger and received the following revelation. The angel warned Joseph Smith not to purchase wine, neither strong drink of your enemies. Joseph then returned home and prepared some wine of our own make for the confirmation meeting, which consisted of the Smiths, the Knights, and John Whitmer. Joseph Smith's history records, We partook together of the sacrament, after which we confirmed these two sisters into the church and spent the evening in a glorious manner. The Spirit of the Lord was poured out upon us. We praised the Lord God and rejoiced exceedingly. These four revelations, received between July and September 1830, provided crucial instructions to Joseph and Emma Smith, as well as other church members, in the formative months following the church's organization. Emma particularly treasured the revelation addressed to her. With the assistance of William W. Phelps, she followed the Lord's instructions to compile the church's first hymnal. In 1842, Joseph Smith read the revelation to Emma at the organizational meeting of the Relief Society. He also read 2 John chapter 1, which references the elect lady and explained that she was called an elect lady because she was elected to preside. Joseph stated that the revelation was then fulfilled by Sister Emma's election to the presidency of the society. The revelation regarding Emma Smith, received during the tumultuous summer months of 1830, was invoked and discussed in Relief Society meetings throughout the 19th century. For example, at a jubilee celebration of the Relief Society's 50th anniversary in 1892, held in the Salt Lake Tabernacle, Zina Y. W. Card read in a very clear and distinct voice the revelation given to Emma Smith through Joseph the Seer, wherein Sister Emma is called an elect lady. Early Relief Society general presidents were sometimes called elect lady. For instance, when Zina D. H. Young became Relief Society general president, Emmeline B. Wells, who herself later served as Relief Society general president, wrote to her, I congratulate you, my beloved sister, on being called to be, according to the words of Joseph the prophet, the elect lady. Doctrine and Covenants, section 26, verse 2. And all things shall be done by common consent in the church, by much prayer and faith. For all things you shall receive by faith. Amen. What is common consent? When members receive callings or priesthood ordinations in the church, we have the opportunity to formally sustain them by raising our hands as a show of support. The principle of demonstrating public support and agreement is called common consent. As President Gordon B. Hinckley taught, quote, The procedure of sustaining is much more than a ritualistic raising of the hand. It is a commitment to uphold, to support, to assist those who have been selected, end quote. From this work is concerned with people, Ensign, May 1995. Ideas for Family Scripture Study and Home Evening Doctrine and Covenants, Section 23, Verse 6 Why does the Lord want us to pray in our family and among our friends and in all places? What does the song, Love is Spoken Here, Children's Songbook, number 190, or another song about prayer, teach us about the power of prayer? See also 2 Nephi, chapter 32, verses 8 through 9, 3 Nephi, chapter 18, verses 18 through 23. Doctrine and Covenants, section 24, verse 8. Would it be helpful for your family to talk about what it means to be patient in afflictions? If you have young children, it might be fun to recreate the experiment that President Dieter F. Uchtdorf described in Continue in Patience, Ensign or Leahona, May 2010. See also the video on churchofjesuschrist.org. What does Doctrine and Covenants, section 24, verse 8, teach us about patience? How does the Lord help us be patient in our afflictions? Doctrine and Covenants, section 25, verses 11 through 12. Perhaps you could sing each family member's favorite hymn or song and talk about why it is his or her song of the heart. How are these songs like a prayer unto God? 
Doctrine and Covenants, section 26, verse 2. It might be helpful to look up common consent in the Guide to the Scriptures, scriptures.churchofjesuschrist.org. How do we show our support for our leaders? For more ideas for teaching children, see this week's outline and come follow me for primary. Suggested Song Lift Up Your Voice and Sing Children's Songbook 252 See Ideas to Improve Your Family Scripture Study Voices of the Restoration Emma Hale Smith The words to Emma Smith recorded in Doctrine and Covenants section 25 reveal how he felt about her and the contributions she could make to his work. But what was Emma like? What do we know about her personality, her relationships, her strengths? One way to get to know this elect lady, see Doctrine and Covenants, section 25, verse 3, is to read the words of people who knew her personally. Joseph Smith, Jr., her husband, quote, With what unspeakable delight and what transports of joy swelled my bosom when I took by the hand on that night my beloved Emma, she that was my wife, even the wife of my youth and the choice of my heart. Many were the revibrations of my mind when I contemplated for a moment the many scenes we had been called to pass through, the fatigues and the toils, the sorrows and sufferings, and the joys and consolations from time to time had strewed our paths and crowned our board. Oh, what a commingling of thought filled my mind for the moment. Again, she is here, even in the seventh trouble, undaunted, firm, and unwavering, unchangeable, affectionate Emma. End quote. See the first footnote at the end of this chapter. Lucy Mack Smith, her mother-in-law, quote, She was then young, and being naturally ambitious, her whole heart was in the work of the Lord, and she felt no interest except for the church and the cause of truth. Whatever her hands found to do, she did with her might and did not ask the selfish question, Shall I be benefited any more than anyone else? If elders were sent away to preach, she was the first to volunteer her services to assist in clothing them for their journey. Let her own privations be what they might. End quote. See footnote number two at the end of this chapter. Quote, I have never seen a woman in my life who would endure every species of fatigue and hardship from month to month and from year to year with that unflinching courage, zeal, and patience which she has always done. For I know that which she has had to endure, that she has been tossed upon the ocean of uncertainty, that she has breasted the storm of persecution and buffeted the rage of men and devils until she has been swallowed up in a sea of trouble which would have borne down almost any other woman. End quote. See footnote number three at the end of this chapter. Joseph Smith Sr., her father-in-law. Emma's patriarchal blessing pronounced by Joseph Smith Sr., who was serving as patriarch of the church. Quote, Emma, my daughter-in-law, Thou art blessed of the Lord for thy faithfulness and truth. Thou shalt be blessed with thy husband and rejoice in the glory which shall come upon him. Thy soul has been afflicted because of the wickedness of men in seeking the destruction of thy companion, and thy whole soul has been drawn out in prayer for his deliverance. Rejoice, for the Lord thy God has heard thy supplication. Thou hast grieved for the hardness of the hearts of thy father's house, and thou hast longed for their salvation. The Lord will have respect to thy cries, and by his judgments he will cause some of them to see their folly and repent of their sins. But it will be by affliction that they will be saved. Thou shalt see many days, yea, the Lord will spare thee till thou art satisfied. For thou shalt see thy Redeemer. Thy heart shall rejoice in the great work of the Lord, and no one shall take thy rejoicing from thee. Thou shalt ever remember the great condescension of thy God in permitting thee to accompany my son when the angel delivered the record of the Nephites to his care. Thou hast seen much sorrow because the Lord has taken from thee three of thy children. In this thou art not to be blamed, for he knows thy pure desires to raise up a family, that the name of my son might be blessed. And now behold, I say unto thee, that thus says the Lord, if thou wilt believe, 
Thou shalt yet be blessed in this thing, and thou shalt bring forth other children to the joy and satisfaction of thy soul and to the rejoicing of thy friends. Thou shalt be blessed with understanding and have power to instruct thy sex. Teach thy family righteousness and thy little ones the way of life, and the holy angels shall watch over thee, and thou shalt be saved in the kingdom of God, even so. Amen. End quote. See footnote number four at the end of this chapter. Thank you for listening to Read Daily's Come Follow Me podcast. Please share this podcast with family members and friends who can find us on readdaily.live or their favorite podcast application. The Intellectual Property Department of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is kindly granting permission to use the audio content heard in this podcast. We express our gratitude for their generosity. Along with granting permission, they ask that we make the following statement. Any products offered by readdaily.live are neither made, provided, approved, nor endorsed by Intellectual Reserve, Inc. or The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Any content or opinions expressed, implied, or included with any goods or services offered by readdaily.live are solely those of Howard Patrick Holman and not those of Intellectual Reserve, Inc. or The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Thank you.